Hey, podcast listeners, Paul Zamufti here from Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College, and I'm your host on another episode of the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. Moderate to severe traumatic brain injury patients remain at high risk of death or poor neurological outcomes. There is increasing evidence that suggests that inflammation contributes to clinical and functional outcomes in traumatic brain injury patients, and the relevance of the immune, innate immune system and the inflammasome in regulation of secondary brain insults following traumatic brain injury has been the focus of intense research over the past few decades. In fact, for as long as I can remember, clinicians and scientists alike have implicated inflammation as a potential etiology for secondary brain injury, yet we remain fixated on clinical indices as predictors of outcome. As we engage further in precision medicine, individualizing care by identifying specific reliable biomarkers that can better assist us in neuroprognostication becomes imperative. Today, you will hear Dr. John Rosenberg discuss with Dr. Juan Perez Barcena and Dr. Juan Pablo de Rivera Vacari on behalf of their co-authors their recent article entitled Serum Caspase 1 as an Independent Prognostic Factor in Traumatic Brain Injury Patients that was published in the Neurocritical Care Journal last September 2021. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Welcome, podcast listeners. This is John Rosenberg from Westchester Medical Center. We have an exciting podcast for you today. I am joined by Dr. Juan Pablo de Rivero Vacari and Dr. John Perez Guatena to discuss their study, Serum Caspase 1, as an independent prognostic factor in traumatic brain injured patients, which was recently published in Neurocritical Care. Pablo, John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. So this was a, this was a prospective observational cohort study, patients with moderate to severe TBI examining the association between serum caspase one level and mortality and long-term neurological outcomes. Why don't we begin by discussing kind of the rationale for the study and reviewing our understanding of the inflammatory process that occurs in TBI? Okay, thank you, John. So yeah, basically, uh, we have what we have been doing in the past several years has been to translate to the clinical field what Pablo and his team has done in his lab. So the first step was to identify the inflammasome proteins, mainly ASC and Caspase one, in TBI patients using a Western blot technique. Then the second step was not only to identify but also to quantify those proteins. Uh, using an ELISA technique. For that reason, we uh, previously studied uh, 21 uh, TBI patients with moderate and severe TBI admitted to the narrow ICU. So in those patients, we collect uh, blood and CSF every eight hours for five days. And in that study, we were able to correlate the CSF levels of Caspis 1 with the outcome of the patients. And we also were able to correlate those high values with the ICP, which was a nice thing. And then uh, the last step has been this uh, paper that was recently accepted in neurocritical care. In this last paper, we have been trying to expand our knowledge to a group of patients with mild, moderate, and severe TBI. And for, for that reason, this paper had three objectives. The third objective was to uh, uh, see if uh, serum caspase 1 uh, was higher. Uh, we were able to correlate these uh, levels of caspase 1 with the outcome of the patients. The second objective of the paper was to answer the question if we can consider Caspase 1 as an independent prognostic factor in TBI. And the last objective of the paper was to try to correlate serum levels of Caspase 1 with the CT findings. As you all know, uh, TBI is a very heterogeneous pathology, and unfortunately, we treat all these patients the same way. We treat a, pa a patient with a dural hematoma the same way we treat a patient with a brain contusion or a patient with a brain swelling or a patient with a diffuse axonal injury. So we were hoping if we could uh, find a relationship between the CT findings and the inflammatory response through the inflammatory levels. And these were the objectives of the study. Thank you, it's a wonderful explanation. So I, I confess I had to learn a little, I had to do a little background in reading your introduction. And basically there's uh, the innate immune response triggers is uh, very active during TBI. And there's certain proteins that are switched on and basically inflammasome complex. And, as discussed in your introduction and in the citations in your introduction, you previously published a lot on this. And this paper, as you mentioned, is a way to kind of the first step at looking at, can we see, we know there's an inflammatory process going on. Is there a biomarker that we can pick out and use it to help uh, predict um, outcome? So 
moving to the study, tell me a little bit about uh, the paper on hand. Describe the study population, key exclusion criteria, outcome measures, and your, your primary and key primary secondary outcomes. Yeah, so basically this was a prospective and observational study with no intervention. The main inclusion criteria was to have any type of TBI in patients between 18 and 80 years old. Uh, the, main, the main exclusion criteria was, first of all, uh, we excluded patients with normal CT. Again, we were really interested in, this, in studying the correlation between the CT findings and the inflammation level. So for that reason, we were not really interested in patients with normal CT. The second biggest uh, exclusion criteria was to have uh, a big trauma. Big trauma defined as an extracranial injury severity score above 18 points. So once the patient arrived to the hospital, we uh, obtained a first blood sample as soon as possible in the ER. And then we also obtained a second blood sample 24 hours after the trauma. For the outcome, we assessed the Glasgow outcome scale extended at six months after the injury. And for the analysis, we dichotomized the Glasgow outcome scale in two, patients with good outcome and patients with poor outcome. Patients with poor outcome were those patients with a Glasgow outcome scale extended between one and four and patients with good outcome were those patients who presented uh, a Glasgow outcome scale extended between five and eight points. To analyze the CT, we use different classifications and different scales. We, of course, use the Marshall classification, but we also uh, used the uh, Rotterdam CT classification, the Helsinki CT classification, and we also quantified the volume of the contusions using the uh, ABC divided by two method. So is the, you took it was to consecutive patients with moderate to severe TBI, had abnormal imaging, draw, drew a cast base level, cast base one level on admission, 24 hours post TBI. And then you're basically one of the main outcome measures you used was addition to mortality, which was the primary outcome, was the Glasgow uh, outcome uh, scale extended, which basically for, for the listeners is a scale of one to eight, one being death, eight yes. being no, no disability. And you know, a scale of one to four, those patients of one to four were considered to have severe disability, poor neurological outcome because they needed some level of dependence, be it full dependence to mild dependence for care. But a score of five to eight, those patients were independent. Some of them were actually able to work on their own. So that was considered to be a good neurological outcome at, at six yeah. months. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so we dichotomized the, the, we dichotomized the, uh, the outcome. One question I had with the methods were, um, were the clinicians blinded to the cast base one levels, the clinicians caring for the patient? Yeah, so the blood, so you cannot measure uh, the serum levels of cast base one online. So you have to get the blood sample, you have to uh, prepare the sample, and then we put it on the uh, refrigerator at minus 80 degrees. So we collect all the samples and then we analyze those samples later, a few months later, okay? Mm -hmm. And the outcome was blinded because uh, the person who uh, performed the outcome was blinded to the levels of the caspase. It basically, 132 patients met inclusion criteria, and you're able, in addition to 33 controls, and you're able to ascertain the long term outcomes on 118 of these patients. Tell us about the, the key results of the study, and to start with the, um, could you start with the, the demographics, distribution of TBS? severity and population, and then from the demographics, we can work on, we can uh, move down to the findings, the, the key findings. So basically, we included 100, as you said, we, we, we were able to include 132 patients in which we obtained the outcome in 180, okay? So, and the results can be divided in three parts. In the first part, we describe that those patients who died and those patients who presented a poor outcome presented higher serum levels of caspase one on admission. And those differences were statistically significant uh, between the groups. And this was a nice finding because, because until now, we, were, we only have been able to describe that correlation in CSF, not in serum. So this was a nice finding for us. The second part of the results uh, is to answer the question if we can consider caspase one as an independent pronostic factor. So we included enough patients in the study so we could perform a multivariate logistic regression analysis. And we created a model in which we included the age, the Glasgow comma scale. We also included the city findings and the caspase one. So in that model, uh, the caspase one was an independent pronostic factor for TBI with an odds ratio of 1.05. 
which means that odd ratio of 1.05 means that every increase in the value of Caspis 1 in 10, in 10 picograms per ml represents a risk, an increase of the risk of poor outcome of 6%. We also made an statistic, a statistical gain using the formula of the impact TVA pronostic calculator. So we use that formula, and to that formula, we added the Caspis 1. So without the Caspis 1 and using that formula, we, the model predicted a poor outcome with an area under the curve of 0.79. When we added the Caspis 1, the model improved to an area under the curve of 0.83. It's just a slight increase, but it's an increase. Okay. And the last part of the result, the results is to describe the correlation of the relationship between the city findings and the uh, serum level of Caspis 1. And unfortunately, we were not able to find any correlation between the city findings and the serum levels of Caspase 1. So we thought that maybe the inflammatory response can be initiated by any type of lesion, subdural hematoma, contusion, or whatever. We, but we could not define any relationship between those two variables. We were able to define a relationship between the severity of the injury and the Caspase 1 level through the Glasgow Coma Scale. So those patients with a severe TBI with a GCS below 8, presented higher values of Caspis 1 compared to those patients with a moderate TBI or patients with mild TBI. So when I read the paper, just to the headline, you saw basically serum Caspase 1 levels on admission, but not at 24 hours, were correlated with mortality and with a poor neurological outcome as defined by a Glasgow Outcome Extended Scale of 1 to 4. You did an ROC analysis where you looked at how predictive the discriminatory capacity for caspase one with predicting mortality and neurological outcome. And the ROC was, it was I think 0 0.648, 0 0.65 for mortality and, and 0.65 for, for neurological outcome. So not, you know, I would say mild predictive value, not just by itself, not doesn't, you know, not, not a really great predictive exactly. value. You are completely right. So what we say is that by itself, caspase one does not predict mortality or outcome. But when we add it to the rest of the variables, it helps. It's not the biggest thing, but it helps. That's the interpretation that we do to that uh, ROC analysis. Then that was both, you added it to your own scale with age, PCS, and Helsinki score on CT, which moved the, the area under the curve from 0.79 to 0.83. And then you also used it in the impact TBI score, which would improve the area under the curve for the impact TBI score. Yeah. when added to that. Um, I thought it was interesting that the uh, caspase one level correlated with the GCS score, the severity of the GCS score, but not the um, any of the radiological predictors, such as the Marshall score or the um, Helsinki CT score. Do you have any thoughts on those results? Yeah, so maybe we were thinking that the, at the end, the inflammatory response can be initiated by any type of lesion. We were hoping, again, to find a correlation between, I don't know, we, I was hoping that maybe the patients with brain contusions, because it's inside the brain, could have a bigger respiratory, uh, inflammatory response, but we didn't find that. And I, what we thought is that, okay, inflammatory response is specific and can be initiated by any type of lesion, maybe a swelling or a brain contusion or subdural hematoma. I think Pablo can give us more clue about that. Basically, yeah. Uh... The whole thing is, as he was saying, it's a, it's a follow-up to, to previous studies where we've looked at uh, several inflammasome proteins. So caspase one is one of, uh, of several proteins that make the inflammasome. And uh, the inflammasome is comprised of caspase one, an adapter protein uh, known as ASC, and also uh, a sensor molecule such as uh, NLRP1 or NLRP3. In the past, we've looked at ASC and NLRP1 uh, in, uh, in the CSF of patients with, uh, with TBI. Uh, we did see uh, a correlation between injury severity and, uh, uh, and the levels of, of uh, AS, uh, ASC and NLRP1, as well as the levels of, as well as the outcome, uh, the, the GOS extended. In addition to that, also in that first study, we were able to look at it in the CSF. So in this case, you're, you're looking at correlations in the, in the blood. So maybe when we start looking more closely to the CNS, like, you know, in the CSF, we could probably could see a, a better uh, correlation with those uh, with uh, things like the CT. In the introduction section of your paper, you get people who are interested in understanding the inflammasome that happens during TBI. 
you've cited all, all of your previous studies that detail this and that detail how the initial biomarkers were, were in the CNS. Another question I had was with regards to the primary outcome, the decision to dichotomize good and bad neurological outcomes based on a range, that got scale one to four versus the Glasgow outcome scale five to extend scale five to eight. Was that decision made before or after the uh, study completion? And then was there also a linear comparison performed perform between cast base one level and, and the GAS E score? So that that was made, um, that analysis was done, um, was that, that decision was done after the study. So yes, and it can be completely uh, discussed. I mean, yeah, we decided that one to four and five to eight, but it could be one to six or seven and eight. That was completely arbitrary. Yeah, it's one of the limitations of the study. Gotcha. Yeah, no, normally, you know, you try to do the, the, the linear regression to see if you get uh, a better a better uh, readout uh, with, with the model. But uh, when the linear regression uh, model doesn't look doesn't look right, then you make the data binary and then you, you're able to do the logistic regression. So that's how we break it down into two. In previous studies, we also use the same scale uh, for our initial studies. Uh, in, in fairness, with a, a single center study in TBI, it's tough. The power, obviously, if you could have the, a multi center study with a higher power, it'd be easier to do the, you know, the linear regression. Would, yeah. You would see the you, you would see the significance, and also more analytes besides mm -hmm. just because you know it's uh, you know in the long term we're just going to look beyond just cast base one. It's uh, there's you know such a multifactorial problem like TBI is not going to have just one analyte. Uh, that tells you any, uh, tells you the important story about the inflammatory response that takes place after TBI. Another question I had is one, one issue with biomarkers, let's say uh, neuron specific enolase or, or D-dimer stuff we use in the ICU is, is the heterogeneity in values and, and versus normal abnormal cutoffs in, in different commercial assays. A, a, a neuron specific enolase greater than 33 may mean uh, baby associated with a poor neurological outcome in one cohort with one assay, but you know, the optimal cutoff may be close to, let's say, 55 with a different assay. Looking at, like, if we're going to use these inflammasome markers as a, as a marker for severity and help us predict outcome in TBI, how can we account for this heterogeneity among commercial assays and biomarkers? The trick comes down to, to what antibodies uh, you're using for the, for the assays. So you have a detection antibody and a capture antibody in a particular assay in a particular platform. So if you even if you change the antibodies in the same platform, you'll have different uh, different readouts. So that will affect your range. So what we uh, found so far is that with the Caspase one assay that we use in this study, that assay from that company is there is a commercial available uh, ELISA assay. It's very uh, it's very reliable. When we look at ASC on interleukin eighteen, which are uh, interleukin eighteen is a downstream cytokine uh, from the inflammasome, we use a different instrument which uh, uses uh, microfluidics. It's called uh, ELA from Protein Simple, and uh, that one gives us more reliability and is a better instrument to measure these uh, these uh, proteins. Uh, particularly for interleukin one beta, I, I liked which is uh, the other cytokine downstream of the inflammasome. We look at uh, we use a different instrument, which is uh, the Quick Flex instrument from uh, Mesoscale. So different instruments will give you different uh, different uh, sensitivities, which you have to take into account. So how do you account that? Uh, uh, it's once you actually incorporate it into the clinic, you actually have to rely on that particular, not necessarily maybe that instrument, that particular instrument, but at least uh, a platform that uses those antibodies that were used for uh, for the for the for the study or that you're used using for your cutoff points. So each each instrument should have uh, with each assay should have their own uh, cutoff points for the particular diagnostic uh, uh, assay that you that you want to develop. In a worst case scenario, in the best case scenario, you know we all use the same antibodies with the same platforms uh, in the same clinical setting, right? Sounds good. I think from from your explanation and from kind of reading your paper and your prior studies, it sounds like your your group has really been the it's been uh, your research has been both a simultaneous discovery of the inflammatory process in TBI and then figuring out the best way to measure it. And you're kind of tailoring. You know, you're really working on multi prongs and kind of tailoring your 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 future studies based on those on those results. So it sounds like it's a it's a work in progress, but yeah, no, definitely. So we started uh, uh, studying the inflammasome in the CNS uh, first after a spinal cord injury back in 2008. We published that study, and in 2009 we showed it that by using antibodies to inhibit the inflammasome after TBI, you can improve histopathology. Uh, 
which uh, is associated also with improvement in outcomes by decreasing microglial activation. And then uh, that correlates, well, that was in, in, in rodents, but then we moved it on to humans where we started doing the biomarker studies. And uh, from our work in rodents, we were able to develop, uh, to start developing uh, monoclonal antibody that we're now going to, that we're developing to test uh, in clinical trials, which is the ultimate goal of the, of the, of, of the program, which, where we can actually use the biomarkers for patient inclusion and then to monitor response to treatment uh, using these inhibitors that, uh, that we're currently developing. And will you be using those biomarkers in, in serum or CSF? And to kind of dovetail that, do you think it would be the future would be to focus on CSF biomarkers or serum biomarkers? Depends on the biomarker, but for instance, for so you mentioned a, a low area under the curve with this assay for caspase one, but for ASC in serum, we, we get area under the curve values above 80.85. Uh, so uh, uh, even as a standalone, uh, looking at this adapter protein ASC in the inflammasome, we get uh, we get a good diagnostic potential, and the 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 biologic that we're developing actually targets uh, ASC. So so we probably be able to look at uh, at serum in this uh, in these patients, uh, which is obviously less invasive uh, and ideal. Okay, uh, so it probably would be based on serum. Sounds sounds good. More less invasive. I'd like to give a give a clinical scenario and kind of see how we can how we can you know how we can incorporate uh, caspase one in in this scenario. So let's say we're taking care of a patient, you know, high grade TBI. Uh, they had an ICP monitor placed. Um, now we're about ten days down the course. ICP was treated. ICP monitor was taken out. Um, unable to wean the patient from the ventilator. Localizing but not really following commands. Mid sixties and the kind of decision comes up with the family. Should we pursue a, a, a tracheostomy and, and a, a feeding tube in this patient? And then, you know, family really wants to have the patient has to have a good outcome. If they are dependent on others for care, it would absolutely not want a trach and peg. Only if it's temporary, they'd want it. And this is a common, I think, um, conundrum that we face in the, in the critical care, especially in neurocritical care. Um, would you use the caspase? Assuming the caspase one level is available to you, at, would you at, on admission? Would you use this in your thought process? And would you use this in the discussion and or would you use this in your discussion to family about what you think of, of their um, potential for recovery? I wouldn't use it because uh, in, in one paper that uh, we published, we <clears throat> obtained blood and CSF samples from uh, TBI patients every hours during the first five days. And we saw that we described the trend of Caspase 1 and we saw the highest values were in the first 24, 48 hours. So we were focusing on the first uh, days where the, these values were higher. I don't know if you get a measurement 10 days after, if it's going to be, if, is, I don't know. If, I mean, we never got to so long. Assuming you had all the measurements you needed, the measurement on admission, you had all the measurements you needed. Okay. Anyway, I will say what they usually say in this type of uh, prognostic calculator, right? So this can help you, but it's not only the, say, the only way to make a decision. It's a very complicated decision, and I, as you previously said, uh, you were right. Caspase one helps, but it's a slight increase uh, in the improvement of the models that we have used. Uh, age is more important. CT findings are more important. Uh, of course, a um, Glasgow Coma Scale is more important on admission that they more important than the Caspase one. Caspase one is one pronostic factor. It's an independent, it's an independent pronostic factor associated that associates with the outcome. But it's not the main, the main uh, prognostic, prognostic factor in this type of patients. I think. I think you have to be honest, and this. Uh, uh, I think you have to be honest, and I think you have to recognize that it correlates with the outcome, but it's not the only main primary thing for the outcome. Uh, on the other hand, we were looking more uh, um, Caspis one not only for uh, prognostic, but also to as a treatment target. And, th and I think that will be the future. I, I think that's the future for us. We are looking Caspis one as a, as a possible target in the future for clinical trials. I think that would be more our goal that focus on the prognostic. But again, uh, before a clinical trial, we have to describe uh, Caspis one as an independent prognostic factor in TBI. And I think this is the paper that the, the goal of, of this paper. So you, you think you're ready to use it in your in your in, 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 in combination with what, are, what we currently do, you're ready to use it now in your, in your discussion and in your thought process. 
I, will, I, I can use it, but it will be the it would it will not be the main thing. I mean, I'm not going to discuss with the family the high levels of gas pressure. One. I think it's more important the patient's wishes, how he is, and the CT findings, or even the MRI, right? Mm -hmm. I just I wouldn't change. Yeah, and I think I, th I think that's probably also the burden of uh, biomarkers when you don't have a, a, a therapy associated with uh, uh, counteracting elevated biomarkers that are that are having shown to be detrimental to patients' outcomes. Right? It's like having giving a diagnosis. Let's say. Well, nowadays, let's say in the case of Alzheimer's, where you see you, you can measure elevated levels of uh, amyloid beta. Nowadays, we have drugs that actually can lower A beta, may not result in uh, neurocognitive improvement, but uh, you know, in the absence of a treatment that can actually uh, uh, lower the particular levels of a, uh, of a particular uh, protein or bio biomarker, then you're then you're kind of out of luck, you know, in that sense. So it's better to uh, to use these biomarkers or have a mentality, the therapeutic, the therapeutics that you could actually develop targeting those biomarkers. And then you can give the option to the patient as, you know, we have these therapies that are shown to lower these proteins that have been shown to be uh, detrimental in, uh, in, in humans and animal models and, and so on. Okay, so I think we, we really covered all of, all of my questions. You guys even, you touched on, you know, Future future applications for cas based one and for the for TBI the field of TBI and biomarkers. Um, is there anything else you'd like to let the readers readers know about any more kind of future plans or, or thoughts or, or anything about the paper that that we that I, I I didn't bring up? I discussed with Pablo earlier. I think the future should be clearly a clinical trial. I mean, we have described the correlation between high levels of cas one serum and poor outcome. But now the big question is, okay, if you can decrease those levels, can you improve patient's outcome? Can you improve patient's outcome? And that's the biggest question. And the only way to answer that question is doing a clinical trial. So right now we are trying to define how to uh, perform this clinical trial. And we have some questions that we have to decide. The first big question is, which type of drug are we going to use? And here we have two options. One option is to develop a monoclonal antibody against, against the caspase one and I think Pablo can, Pablo can give us some information about that. Or maybe we can um, use some type of old, old drug with known anti-inflammation properties, like maybe probenefit or prometheazole. Once we decide which drug are we going to use, the second step would be to define the inclusion criteria. And again, unfortunately, we were not able to make a correlation between city findings and caspase one I was hoping to find that correlation. So in the inclusion criteria, I will add, okay, patients with brain contusions present higher levels of cas one so I randomized the patient. We have not been able to de demonstrate that correlation. So what I was thinking is that maybe uh, we can use the admission serum levels of cas one as an inclusion criteria for the trial. For example, the patient arrives to the ER, you measure the serum levels of cas one and if those levels are high, then you randomize the patient. It doesn't make any sense to give an anti-inflammatory medication in a patient with low levels. And I think that would be a novel, a new approach for clinical trials in TBI, which most of them have failed so far. So anyway, whatever we decide, the next step should be a phase two safety clinical trial to study, of course, the safety of the medication and define these uh, issues that I just, I just mentioned. I, I can see now from your, John, from your response that and from what Pablo was saying earlier, why well, I see it. It makes sense that maybe sticking with the serum is probably the if we're going to have targeted therapies and quick quick turnaround time and most inclusive sample sticking with ways to get serum biomarkers maybe better than going back to the CSF. Yeah, again, yeah, we 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 started with CSF first using the Western blot and then the ELISA, and the CSF is interesting because the levels of caspis one in CSF are much lower than in blood. Uh, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, uh, in those papers, we describe the correlation between only CSF, uh, serum, uh, serum, CSF caspis one levels and the outcome. And in this paper, uh, it was a nice thing to see that we also could, we were able to describe that correlation in serum, which was, which was nice using a commercial ELISA that uh, that we used. Okay. Pablo, anything from your end? Yeah, you know, as as uh, so as, as John was saying, you know, the the whole developing uh, a, a therapeutic so that instead of focusing uh, more on on uh, diagnostic or prognostic biomarkers, we can actually look at uh, theragnostic biomarkers. So the response to treatment, 
And uh, to that end, uh, so the whole the whole trick with the inflammasin is that when caspase one gets uh, gets activated, it uh, it activates farther down two uh, imp uh, inflammatory cytokines, interleukin one beta and interleukin eighteen, that have been shown to to be detrimental to the activation of the, of the adaptive immune response, which is B cells, T cells, and and all these other uh, pathways of the adaptive immune response. But for that inflammasin to be activated these proteins have to come together. Three proteins have to come together. Caspase 1, ASC, and a sensor protein like NLRP1 and NLRP3. So we're developing a, a, an inhibitor, a monoclonal antibody, a biologic against ASC, which in addition to having shown to, uh, in our previous studies, to have a, a, a high area under the curve as a biomarker in, in serum and CSF, uh, we, uh, we, also, we also show that when these proteins come together into ASC, to bind to ASC, then the inflammasin gets activated. So if we inhibit ASC with a, a, a monoclonal antibody, then there is no acti activation of the inflammasin. And mm -hmm. that's when you actually have the potential to inhibit inflammation in a more effective way. And we and others uh, uh, around the world are, are, are in the quest to find inflammasin inhibitors because inflammasin is, is present in a variety of diseases, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, metabolic diseases, uh, NASH, um, arthritis, psoriasis, Crohn's colitis, a spectrum. So there will be a therapy that we can actually test in TBI targeting the inflammasome and, and further uh, studying this uh, by uh, prognostic and theragnostic uh, potential of uh, the inflammasome as uh, biomarkers. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us. It is a pleasure to hear about your research and I look forward to looking at future to kind of keeping my eye on the inflammasome and TBI and hearing about future biomarkers and future drug trials. No, thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 With continuously updated content on topics ranging from acute ischemic stroke to clinical evaluation of coma and brain death, prognostic assessment, and traumatic spinal cord injury, Neurocritical Care On Call is the only product of its kind to offer content exclusively dedicated to the practice of neurocritical care. This interactive subscription-based website features tables and figures, videos, author insights, and sections specific to nursing, pharmacists, and APPs. To learn more about subscribing to Neurocritical Care On Call, visit www.neurocriticalcare.org forward slash on call. Use promo code podcast for an extra 10% off your subscription. Thanks for listening to the NCS podcast. The NCS podcast is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, education, and advocacy in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Tarek El Maghribi, Andrew Barishman, Leonid Groisman, Atul Kalanuria, Lauren Kaufman, Cassie Cronfield, Holly Ledyard, Lindsay Marchetti, Alexander Reynolds, Lucia Rivera Lara, John Rosenberg, Jason Siegel, Zachary Threckle, Teddy Yoon, and Chris Zaman. Our administrative staff and senior producers, Bronny Rosso. Music by Mohan Katapali from the University of Miami Division of Neurocritical Care. If you like our show and want to learn more about us, check us out on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. The NCS podcast is available on NCS On Demand, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Fawaz Mufti, and thanks for listening.